Well, we're saving the best for last because we're going into um, a session that looks at taking learning beyond the organization. So lots um, so far in the conference about organizational learning, making things happen with your employees, bringing them on and so on. But what if you also have responsibility for getting development out to people that aren't necessarily in the organization and within your control. So what if you've got channel partners or agents or, heaven forbid, customers that you're trying to train as well, and people who aren't necessarily directly influenced by the organization. Um, and that's a very real situation for many, including our two speakers today. Um, and it's one that you know is a great conundrum for all of us. So um, that's what we're going to be looking at next. Um, Two speakers that have got great experience in this. We've got Dieter Tolstorff, who's the training manager of Hyundai Europe, who will talk to us first, um, who's got a big distribution channel that he has to um, influence and get learning out to. And then Anthony Pugh, who works for Imosat, which is all about satellite um, technology. Um, and Anthony's looking at e-learning development um, for them and will tell us about what he's doing in terms of training customers, because actually that's an area of influence for him as well. So two quite different um, stories from the ones that we've heard all through the last couple of days. Um, so we will kick off with Dieter. Um, Dieter actually started his career as a car mechanic um, and then took various steps to end up where he is now as training manager for Hyundai Motor Europe. Um, and uh, he started there really with as being a, just a technical trainer, didn't you, Dieter? And then moving right up into the training management role. So, good story to tell, Dieter. Please feel free okay, to carry thank on. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, I started as a car mechanic, but meanwhile, my real passion is training. And you might imagine that with an organization like Hyundai, uh, which is a worldwide operating car manufacturer, hopefully you know it already. Um, so we are concentrating on Europe. What we deliver is, we call it master courses. So we have to take care of about 27 countries, 3,500 dealers, more than 30,000 people. A little bit more about that later on. And you can see as Hyundai is uh, uh, dealing with technology, we have continuously spread information towards all employees in the dealership because they have to deal with the cars, the customers driving around to make them driving safely. And of course for this, we were in the need to have uh, some good tools and we started to implement a learning management system which should cover all Europe. And to do this, sounds easy, a single simple sentence, but to do it in reality is tough work and why, I will show you step by step. So we have selected okay. we have selected a central installation. That means that in the headquarter, we have the rights to, to see the all European network. That was crucial for us because what happened before, each country made their own e-learnings. Each country developed on cost base e-learning for themselves, but beside the factor that they have to put money on the table, which is partially their money, but partially it was ours because some of the distributors belong directly to us. So we spent money for the same thing several times. But more important was each country did what they think is the right thing to do. Um, understandable, we, we do that when we are children. It's nice to play around on our own play field, but for us as the headquarter, we thought, no, it's not the right way to do because we have a certification program in place which should be equal over Europe. Especially nowadays, people are more flexible. Sometimes they have to be. And some countries are very close to each other. And what happened in the past was a guy from Germany went to Austria. Sometimes this is just 10 kilometers, so it's easy. And then they found the education is different. Same company, same master course, but different education, different tests. So that led to the point that we had to think about what to do to unify that. And the solution was a single system and, of course, 
it must cover many languages. And it must accommodate still the own playground. Let's talk about that a little later on. So the difficulty is a single installation which allows enough freedom for the individual countries. Otherwise, they will not accept and it's going to fail. So we had to think about what system to select. Yeah, and this shows the difficulties behind when you start looking. We are the Euro European headquarter, but the point is we have contracts with our distributors. As I said, some of them are direct daughter companies. We have a little bit stronger influence, but the majority is fully independent. So we, we have a contract with them, but they are still independent companies, no directories. And then it gets even worse in parentheses. The distributor has contract with the dealers in the country, but we don't. So legally, we have no means to directly do something to the dealer, not at all. And then the dealer has the legal contract with their employee. But we need and want to reach the employee at the end of the day, because these are the people working with our customers. These are the people we want to influence to get trained in the best way. And of course, it seems to be easy, yeah? just do some contracting and then job done. But actually, it's not that easy. First of all, there are different regulations. Uh, secondly, the independent partners are not willing easily to sign contracts without having a need. So that, that is um, <clears throat> what we had to observe. And there were a lot of things coming along when doing the implementation. So this is the background of the story. And what you need to look up, <clears throat> there are basically three pillars which came along to be necessary to be successful. There is a software product as such, which is the learning management or learning content management system together. Then the contracts we had to establish between all the parties, which of course is a contract between the vendor and us, but then also between us and our um, distributors. So these things Relatively easy, I would say. Just read all the laws, get in contact with your lawyer department, and yeah, it sorts out somehow. Software product, yeah, that's already a little bit more critical. Let's talk about that very soon. And then, <clears throat> and do not underestimate the relationship you have with your partners or the intended partners. Believe it or not, this is the most critical stepstone. If there is a good relationship, it's more easy to make a negotiation for some contracts. And sometimes you even don't need it. They just do it because the relationship is there. So if that is not working well, you, you have to do real uh, tremendous effort. So think about that all along. Good. <clears throat> so we are talking about what is from our point of view and the experience while rolling out that uh, system, what is the most critical part? And that is the relationship, the stakeholders. Let me put a question here. What do you think, who is the most important stakeholder? The customers, yes. Um, what I want to say here, don't forget yourself. You must be convinced. I come to that with the next part. So first of all, be sure you did the right choice. Make all the settings, look around. Then what we did to have success, we had um, pilots. So we started in a small, relatively small uh, playground. We were thinking quite big because we talk about all over Europe at the end of the day. But we started small with three pilots. The three pilots were selected um, Germany, because that's where we are based, so it's easy. I just jump in the car and drive there, remember relationships. France, because that's a, a big market, 
and has um, an external supplier for their training. So you might imagine here it gets even more complex because we don't have a contract directly with their dealers, but even the trainings, they uh, use the external agency. So now another party comes into the game. That's why this pilot was chosen. And finally, Belgium, because that's a real fully independent partner. So we had two which have a more strong relation to us to make the game a little bit more easy because we have more reach to them. They are daughter companies. And the third one is a fully free distributor because we wanted also to show this is beneficial if you are not belonging to Hyundai in that close family, in the close tied up, okay? Um, what we found is, again, the selection and the involvement of the pilots don't do it what we in Germany call five minutes to 12 because that gives you more trouble. Do it, do it early. The earlier, the better. And that's actually the reason why this um, is coming before the next slide, which shows about the selection process. You also could do it around, but I strongly recommend have the pilot on board as early as possible. What we did actually, we even discussed the system settings with them. How shall it look like? What kind of job roles we want to define and so on. So they had some influence on the system, which makes them accepting it easy. And they will become ambassadors because it's some, somehow also their baby. If you, if you start early, they feel, yeah, this is not something we get put on. This is something we develop together. And that's the crucial point. Yeah, and here I would like to put a question. Who of you is going into the holiday without proper planning? Anyone? Okay. A few, then I recommend if you have ever to do this job, don't do it like that <laughs> because it's really important. What, what we did basically, first we put a catalog, what is needed for our business. And this you have to find for your business as well. What kind of functionalities, what's our structure, what kind of things we need to put across. Do we need a hierarchy? Yes or no? Because some tools, they don't even allow to have a hierarchy. For us, this is a no-go because our business structure needs hierarchy, different levels of um, authority. And also here already, the pilots were involved. And that, that was the good point at the end of the day because some issues were coming up. All of a sudden, one of the pilots came along and said, oh, we are now far, but sorry, we just recognized you can see the data of the dealer employee directly. So if that's the case, we are really sorry, we cannot sign the contract. That was not done until that point. So we were really working on trust base in the beginning. That was really important for us especially when that came up. So, what to do? And then the first reaction would be shouting, writing a very bad email, putting pressure on them. <clears throat> My recommendation is don't. When I, when I get the message by this, um, via email, I was just going to the phone. That was my intention, but I just put the hand in the pocket, went home for sleeping, and the next day, I was considering what to do now. And I started to investigate what's the background of this. Why all of a sudden, because they were basically knowing, why all of a sudden this comes up and they say, yeah, if that's the case, we cannot sign. Any idea? Yeah? Data protection, of course. Um, but it was even more um, what, what we found is it was not really the, the director of the, the distributorship which caused the problem. It was the German dealer council. They were saying, this is a no-go because there is no legal contract and so on. And we were then thinking, okay, what to do now? So we started to talk and, and investigate. And what we found, 
at the end of the day, if we slightly change our internal contract between the German distributor and us, and if we reduce the amount of data we need in the system, because nowadays we have a tendency, what's the birth date, what's your wife's name, what's the weight of your dog, what do you do on uh, Christmas, and all these kind of things, a huge data, and many of them, do we really need them? Maybe no. So we started to reduce the amount of data, and then we changed the terminology in the contract in the way that we became, um, how you would say that, we became the administrators for Germany. As a system administrator, of course, naturally you need to see what's in the system. So with these two actions um, and the extension which says we are not giving any data to the outside and only certain persons have access as administrators, that was legally perfect. And then the German uh, distributor had no objection anymore because they understood the system itself is quite good. And what we are going to do is beneficial for everyone. So that was a real, real good uh, experience because, to be honest, without having the partnership beforehand, I'm sure this would have failed because the tendency of a German, and I know what I'm talking about because I am one, would say, this is the legal situation, go away, forget it, yeah, and that's it. But because of the build-up partnership in the early days of the project, we, we worked it out together because everyone had an interest to come, to overcome that situation. So that shows this is a real critical thing. Now, when the system is installed, story is not at the end because now it starts to become complex with a lot of countries. Because very quickly we were in a position to uh, extend from the pilots to other countries like Italy was joining early, Romania, which is a small country, but they were even volunteering, Turkey, which doesn't even belong to our region. And that is remarkable because it shows Everybody believes in what we have done. That was really good. Now we need to think about, okay, we deliver centralized content. E-learning about our cars, about how to handle customers, and so further. But that's English. So what now? We need to translate, and that is usually kind of pain, I can tell you. Luckily, there is some uh, part in the system at least ease that process. Because what happens with the translations is, who is proving them? This work has to be done by the distributor because we cannot. Sometimes they have specific language, in, especially in technical terms. So again, you need that partnership. If you create English and you ask your agency, please translate, and you just put it in the system, what you receive usually, and I had that with another early days um, when I was working in another ma manufacturer, they say, what kind of translation is that? So they have to proofread. So the system we have chosen <coughs> has one part for the creation of content, and then it goes to what, what we call internally the editing side, and there the partners can see the e-learning and can see the translation and can make corrections quite easily. That's uh, reducing the workload. And after everybody is happy and all parties means us, we review what they have changed and they are happy, their bosses are happy, then it goes in what we call the life cycle. This is what the dealer personal will see at the end of the day. And that's guaranteed in terms of um, content. Everybody is fine with that. Yeah, no problem. Important is also that the system will trace what copies are running around. To be honest, our first project, we had the learnings with that um, because the system was quite fine, but we were not clever enough to use it as we should. But now we understand what to do, and that also brings along in some way in the process, get trained, get your people trained to use the system as much as you can and as often as you can. Otherwise, um, 
people have a tendency to say, yeah, the system is not good, and there is this and that. And finally, it's because we didn't do our job good enough, they get, didn't get enough training. So there are some lessons learned in that aspect. And of course, it's not only translation. Unfortunately, at least in the car business, there are different specifications in the countries, which means just translating the content is not enough. They have to adjust. I think you know that situation quite well, because we have this. Yeah. So this shows very clear. There must be a possibility for each individual country to work in their level somehow independent, to make some changes. Otherwise, again, it will fail, because the country then will tell you, this system is not good, the content is not right, there are different specs, and so further and so further. And never forget, people have a tendency, they want to have their freedom. So what we have, the system allows that the country can work independently, in theory, fully independently, and we are just looking, you are still doing what we want. So also here the cooperation is needed. Otherwise, they will always try to escape, and sooner or later they manage. Yeah, so as we have done our homework, we have planned our holidays beforehand. Um, there were still some ob obstacles, but finally we implemented the system. We have so far eight countries live where the system is ready, where the people using. We have now in the pipeline seven countries coming up, which shows starting small, but then move quickly because we had the big picture, which is all over Europe. Means also that your partner must be ready to take this challenge. And you have to organize all this. And not every time that goes as you want. So sometimes what you need to have is patience and wait a little bit. Sometimes you have to push them strongly. Because at the end of the day, there are three major factors which we found when you want to implement a system. For me, still number one is people, 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 means all the stakeholders. And there are a lot around. Did you talk to your IT? Who is having the ownership? Is it training or is it IT department? A lot of things. Then at the distributors. And even the stakeholders of your stakeholders have an influence here. That's why it's people, people, people. Really do the homework. Investigate what's the environment for what you need to do. Otherwise you get into real big trouble. And sometimes look behind the scene. What is the reason that a certain thing is denied or why somebody asked, I want to have it like this. And then, as we found, it was not really the distributor aiming for that. It was another force in the background. Once we knew that, we could solve it. If we would consider that it's the distributor himself, we would target the wrong solution. Yeah. So look behind the scenes, and at the end of the day, this reflects again number one. That was all I wanted to tell you. It's a very quick introduction in all the fun and all the hassles you might get into when you do that. Thank you. Right, well, thanks for, for hanging on till the end to, to, to listen to me. I hope this is uh, going to be worth your while. Um, thanks for the introduction, Kathy. Um, I've been working in learning and development for about uh, 10 years now. Uh, I'm just looking for my clicker, actually. Oh, there we go. Um, and exclusively in e-learning for about the last five years. Uh, I joined a company called Inmarsat nearly three years ago now, and my remit was to introduce online learning uh, at Inmarsat. Have any of you heard of Inmarsat before? Quick show of hands, a few nodding heads. Anybody hasn't heard of Inmarsat? <laughs> That's okay. I was expecting more, more people to have not heard of Inmarsat. That's absolutely fine. When I joined Inmarsat, I had never heard of the company either. Um, it's actually a, a really big company. Um, before I talk more about what I do at Inmarsat, I wanted to give you a quick overview of Inmarsat's work. It's quite important to sort of 
give you a bit of background um, as to what we do, and then that hopefully will give you a bit of an introduction into my role at Inmarsat. So I'm sure you'll all remember. Oh, <laughs> all right. I'll uh, do this old school. Right, okay. Let's give this a go. Right, so I'm going to tell you a little story uh, to help introduce uh, what I'd like to talk about. Um, I'm sure you all remember back in November of last year, um, the, 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 the strongest, um, the largest tropical cyclone ever recorded swept through parts of Southeast Asia, um, killing almost 6,000 people um, in the Philippines alone. A really tragic uh, event happening at the end of last year. It took um, over three weeks um, for many of the, the, the parts of the Philippines and Southeast Asia to start getting some food and water uh, and medical aid, and maybe most importantly, communication into that area to let people know that there was actually an issue um, and, and that maybe they, they were still alive. So I'm just going to show you a short video that we captured from Channel 4 News, um, which is just talking about an individual story throughout the, uh, the tragedy. Uh, and hopefully this will give you a bit of relevance into in Marsat's role. Now, of, uh, politics, let's go to the politics of Mother Nature in the Philippines with Alex Thomas. It's around 20 past 3 in the morning and I'm standing tonight uh, on the outskirts of the city of Jackal Valley, a place which has very much become the kind of epicenter of this disaster in so many ways. Let me tell you what I think is now happening. There's a real sense of genuine fear and anger. People who come through the fact that they've lost their livelihoods, they've lost their homes, begin to think, here I am on an island, I can't get water, I can't get food, I might die here, long after the storm has gone. There's also an emotional response to this, and this is global, as people try to find out just what happened to their loved ones, their family, that they just haven't heard of since last Thursday, when they were preparing for the incoming typhoon. It's not often you could intervene or answer any of these calls, but one man did get in touch with me about 24 hours ago, and we decided to do what we could. A random speculative tweet from a total stranger last night into this devastated landscape. A man called Christian. My family are in a small town called Tabon Tabon, in central Leyte, 20 miles southwest of Tacloban. No news since Thursday. Will you go there? By the time we made the ferry over to Leyte Island, Christian in London had given all the details he could about his large family's last known location. Mother, father, grandmother, five uncles, two aunts. Night followed a four hour journey into the interior of Leyte Island, the road littered with fallen trees and debris every yard of the way. What people here are saying is they're a couple of kilometres up the road. Turns out they're a very popular family. It was now well into the evening but people were saying we were close, and then a breakthrough. They appear to be here and alive. Okay, you show, show, show us where Peter is. Peter and Eliza Cranfield, Christian's parents. Hello, we're from Channel 4 News in London. We're looking for Peter and Eliza. I'm here, we're here. Eliza, we have Christian in London. He hasn't heard from you since Thursday. Oh He's... My God, I know, oh my God, eh? Hi, Christian, it's Alex here. Um, we found uh, your mum, and I think she might want to have a word with you. She's got some news. Here she is. Yeah? Hello, darling. Hello, mum. I'm really glad to see you, boy. Yeah. <laughs> they found us. We were just thinking, how are we going to go home? Everyone's fine, baby. Everyone. How about you? I'm so sorry. You you worried. Can I? In London, Eliza's son Christian and daughter Shauna have bravely agreed to be filmed, whatever the news might be. That is, until one of the grandchildren accidentally cut the phone line, and that was that. So yeah, an unfortunate end, but obviously a really nice story there from such a, a tragic event. and. The reason I showed you that video is you probably all noticed that the news presenter was using a big, what looked like a brick with an antenna on it, it was actually a satellite telephone. Uh, and that's uh, what Inmarsat manufactures. And as you can see, if I just remember to click the slide, I've got to remember to keep doing that. 
it was an Inmarsat ISAT phone pro that they were using. So to cut a long story short, Inmarsat provides um, satellite communications to anywhere on the Earth's surface that you can imagine that you can't use a normal telephone, where you might not have um, normal internet services. Um, so how do we do this? This is the exciting part. Well, we have a constellation of 12 satellites. Uh, this is uh, showing the behavior of a satellite, which has been launched and is now operating at 36,000 kilometers away from the Earth's surface. It's difficult to imagine the context of that distance, but if you were to imagine if you flew in an airplane from Heathrow all the way around across Sydney and back to Heathrow Airport, that's about 40,000 kilometers. So you can imagine how far away from Earth these satellites are in operation. Now, we've got, as we said, 12 satellites. We require at least three satellites to provide uh, global coverage. Um, and our latest uh, constellation of satellites, which are being launched this year, uh, it's a new, um, a new service called Global Express, which is going to provide high-speed broadband around the globe. And we've invested one and a half billion US dollars. It's a lot of money in the techno techno technological side of things. The uh, lifetime of these satellites is between 15 and 20 years. And the reason that they, uh, their life ends is due to uh, 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 their, their fuel um, finishing, essentially. I always find it quite amusing when people talk about the end of a satellite lifetime, lifetime, and people say the reason for that is because they actually run out of petrol, but there's not many, uh, many gas stations up at 36,000 kilometers away. Anyway, the reason that I wanted to, to talk about Inmarsat before I talked about the learning was because we really have a, a massive global network of First of all, distribution partners who are our, our main customers, and we, we would estimate that we're probably talking tens of thousands of people around the world who use Inmarsat products and services. So we really do have a global network of, of customers and people who are using Inmarsat's products and services. So just to, just to sum up, the way it works is um, the users have got the terminals. They might be on land, they might be in the air, they might be on a ship. They send their messages up to the satellite, which then relays that back down to the ground earth station, and that signal is then fed onto the, the person receiving the email or making the uh, receiving the telephone call, and then that uh, process is reverted the other way. And we're talking in a, uh, in a millisecond. If any of you have any of you been on a cruise ship before? Yeah, a few nods. Have any of you made a telephone call from a cruise ship or um, used the internet? Yeah? That's satellite technology. You've probably used Inmarsat's equipment to make that telephone call. So if you've used Skype, it's that kind of delay. It's, it's, it's almost in, uh, unnoticeable these days. We have three main areas of customers. Um, the maritime industry is our primary um, area of, of customer base. And if you think about the word Inmarsat, it comes from international maritime satellites. So up until, I think, 1989, we dealt exclusively with providing uh, ships that are sailing around the ocean with satellite communications. Um, and we've now got quite a big market in the aviation sector. It won't be long until we're all, uh, all, we, all, we all have high-speed broadband available to us in our uh, long-haul flights and, and passenger airlines. And as you saw in the video, we have a, a big customer base in the, in the land uh, sector as well. So let's talk more about what we're here for. Um, e-learning content and, and moving um, content online. When I joined Inmarsat in 2011, I joined the Inmarsat Training Academy, which was a team of technical trainers. And I was quite surprised when I joined, there wasn't any form of online learning at all. So my, my job, my responsibility was to introduce um, online learning to our customers around the world. Now Inmarsat's customers, um, as we said, there's 10,000 people potentially around the, the world using Inmarsat's products and services. Obviously, with a team of training, um, technical trainers, it was impossible to get out to all of those customers. So the um, strategy was to train the distribution partners at the top of the train, um, of which we have at the moment, I think, 36. And you can see that as we go down the distribution channel, um, we have more and more um, resellers and, and end users. And the idea is that that training then filters down through the channel and eventually reaches the end users at the bottom. So when I joined um, the Training Academy, um, as I said, all of their training was delivered in a classroom-based environment. This was the split in 2011. We're talking about 1,200 people receiving this learning per year. And this has remained fairly constant over the last sort of 10 years of Inmarsat 
Training Academy being a, a, a division within the organization. You can see the breakdown, sort of 75% of classroom training uh, compared to sort of 25% uh, web conferences and, and WebEx training. So my first challenge was to introduce a learning management system. Uh, we're probably a little bit behind the curve compared to, to Dieter. We introduced this in, in 2012. We used a learning management system called Absorb LMS, uh, and I. UK distribution partner is a company called Omniplex, who are downstairs at the Learning Technology Exhibition. We've been really excited, really pleased with the learning management system. I'm not going to get into too much about the LMS today, because I wanted to talk more about the content. But when I arrived at Inmarsat, we had a lot of content. And the majority of the content, I'd say literally 99% of the content, was PowerPoint. Um, I was just given a folder full of PowerPoint presentations with extremely little accompanying documentation. So there was no uh, scripts, there was no videos, there was no images. It was just basically a, a sort of a brain dump from the technical trainers and the su subject matter experts who kind of got everything out and used PowerPoint as their tool to, to, to sort of get it out there. So it was a real challenge for me to take that content and not only introduce a learning management system, but to try and take that content, which is, as you can see, highly technical, quite dry subject matter, you know, there's, we actually work with rocket scientists in our office, so you can imagine these geeks getting really excited about networks and broadband speeds and internet connections and stuff. It, it's quite crazy, but um, yeah, as you can see, it's quite technical stuff. So it was a case of my first sort of tactic, the thing that I did first, was take these PowerPoint presentations and try and rebuild them to make them a little bit more engaging. We also sat down with the subject matter experts and we got them to write, or to, to write together, we wrote scripts so that we could actually present them without the, the, the trainer or the subject matter expert being there. And slowly but surely, we started making videos with these PowerPoint presentations so that we, we were making what was essentially maybe a one day course of PowerPoint and we were making, chopping them down into sort of hundreds of two to five minute videos so that they could actually be put into the learning man management system in an organized structure. Essentially, you're looking at a course, but it could be dipped in and out of, and we could direct people at a two-minute video because that video had a unique URL. So this next little video snip shows you some of the content that we've been working on. If you look in the top left-hand corner, this is an example of a PowerPoint presentation that we've rebuilt. Uh, we, you can see from this that we've started adding different features, like we've added narration, we've added a, a live presenter on some of the videos, so you've actually got somebody introducing the content. We've added uh, live video demonstrations of how to repair products, how to set up products. Um, and then once we created this sort of base of, of videos, and I know people are probably looking at me thinking, you know, recording PowerPoint presentations is not proper e-learning. And it's one of my pet hates when somebody gives me a PowerPoint presentation and says, can you make that into e-learning? I'm sure you've all had that before. Um, I, I'm fully aware that you know, maybe it's not the most effective form of learning, but it was a real quick win for us because it enabled us to free up those trainers from delivering that training over and over again, and then we could focus those guys on delivering uh, training on new products and new services. We then moved into rapid authoring. As you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, we started using Articulate Storyline to deliver interactive e-learning. We started designing some of our own interactions. And what we were, what we were able to do was slot some of these different, tool, uh, different um, out productions and outputs into uh, the courses that we'd already created. So we built the, the structure first, and then we slotted the different modules into that structure. And we're on the, on the lookout constantly for using new, new tools. So we've got an example here, Prezi, um, Videoscribe, um, Codebaby. There's lots of different pieces of software that we're using and we're experimenting with to try and make that learning more engaging and more interactive. Right, so have we been successful? Um, we're still extremely early into our journey. Our learning management system was only launched less than 18 months ago. So it's, it's very early days, and you know, this time next year I might, might not have a job. So we'll see how that goes. But early, early, early signs are looking really positive. And if we um, look at some, some statistics, um, this is going to be a graph to show us a comparison between the amount of people who have received instructor-led training in Marsat compared to the amount of people who've received online uh, learning. So you can see it's been quite consistent over the last few years, and we're obviously forecasting for 2014, 2015. We can see that we're talking between 1,000 and 1,500 people. You've only got five to 10 technical trainers. You can only fit 25 people into a, a classroom. You can only fly to a certain num number of countries in the world. So there's a, a, an upper limit on how much you can train. 
With our um, online learning, obviously in 2011 we didn't have any. By 2012 we had a small uh, introductory group, I would say, of 250 people who were regularly using our learning management system. But it was 2013 uh, where we really sort of made some headway and, and last year was exciting because we actually bypassed, uh, online learning actually bypassed the amount of classroom-based learning that we did. So 1,239 people received classroom-based learning last year, whereas 1,300 people sat through an e-learning course through the LMS. So that was a, a real sort of groundbreaking year. And based on the, the, you know, the current uptrend and the upturn in people using this, this form of learning, we've got quite ambitious, but we think realistic plans to expand over the next uh, 18 months. And we expect that by the end of uh, 2014, 3,500 people around the world will be uh, learning online and potentially up to 6,000 in 2015. Now, obviously, there's a cost involved with providing this type of learning. Um, and I've got another swanky PowerPoint chart that shows you uh, a cost comparison. Now, all of our technical trainers obviously require some form of salary, so that adds up. And as I said, we are really a, a global company. So these trainers are on the road 24-7, um, 365 days a year. We have to pay for accommodation, transport, late changes for itineraries. So these guys essentially cost a lot of money to, 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 to provide that learning. Um, it, the, the, the money we've invested in e-learning so far, as you can see, is actually dwarfed by the amount of money that we're investing in classroom-based learning. So these graphs that I've showed you, they look great. The figures look fantastic. So I'm sure um, business... Business people will come back to me and say, you haven't really demonstrated any value in that learning. Is, is that learning effective? Is, are people going away and, and doing their jobs better than we, we were before? If you come to my presentation this time next year, you can find out the answer to that. But as it stands, we're, we're excited about this. It's looking, it's looking really promising. And, and when we've got more meaningful data in the future, we, we feel that we can co confidently demonstrate that we're making an impact. So just to sum up then, um, I just wanted to finish up by giving you um, sort of five things really that I've learned from my role at Inmarsat over the last couple of years. Uh, the first one is that I think it's important not to be, not to be scared to start small. Uh, one of the things that I was maybe afraid of when I launched the learning management system at Inmarsat was um, whether um, I was worried, I was quite concerned about whether there was going to be enough people using the learning management system straight away. Was there enough course content on there? Were people going to get on there and think, oh, this is you know, a little bit limited? But actually, I should have been focused more on making sure that the product was good, making sure that the content was effective, and actually focusing on generating more traffic and driving more people to your learning management system is something you can do after it's launched. Once it's there, you can tweak the management system after. So that's, that's one of my first sort of key takeaways. Second of all, um, I should have learned this from watching Dragon's Den, really. I think they always say this to entrepreneurs, is that if you're going to start a business, you should always double your predicted costs and uh, double the amount of time it's going to take to set up the business. I would say that's pretty true of a learning management system as well. So whatever you expect to spend and however long you expect it to take, it, probably doubling it is a good rule of thumb. Third of all, um, I found that involving the subject matter experts, and I, you know, I, wasn't, I wasn't perfect at this by a long, a long means, and um, I'm still working on these relationships day in, day out, but involving the subject matter experts and the technical training team to ensure them that this product that you're launching is complementing what they're doing and you're not making their jobs redundant, essentially, is, is so important. Because these, these are the guys who are going to be promoting uh, your learning management system. And it's really important, I've found, to sell uh, the benefits of the learning management system and your online learning, uh, online learning platform to the subject matter experts and the technical training team. And then they will go away and promote that for you and, and be um, proactively helping you in advertising. So a feature-rich LMS doesn't necessarily mean, uh, doesn't mean a lot if you don't have relevant content. Again, it's no use having all these bells and whistles, social feeds, uh, badges, competitions, polls, news feeds, all these different things that you can now get in, in your learning management system. They're kind of irrelevant if people aren't going there to access the content. So we're really lucky with Absorb. It's almost as easy as flicking a switch to turn different features on and off. Uh, but we found that that's really important. Once you've got people that are coming to your learning man management system regularly, we find that then you can maybe engage them with some more features afterwards. 
And last but not least, uh, this was quite, I found this quite amusing actually. When I launched the learning management system, we created all these posh courses. I was really expecting floods of emails to come in, letting me know how fantastic the courses were, how grateful they were as to that we've now moved into online learning and all, all their problems would be solved. But it didn't really happen that way. And whilst we got a lot of you know, people saying thank you and, and that they were appreciative of what we'd done, we'd actually raised the bar. And because we now were offering online learning and some of the courses were great, people were thinking, well, hang on a minute, you haven't got a course on this, that, and the other. So we had a lot, we've had a lot of emails of people saying, you know, where's this, where's that, this is missing. So just, just something to be aware of, I guess, is that if you offer something that's actually pretty high quality, um, you might get sort of customers uh, querying wh where certain, certain parts, certain learning materials are. So just five, five things that I've learned. I'm sure there's hundreds more, but uh, those are the, the sort of the five things that stood out for me. Yeah, and I think that's about it, really. So thanks ever so much for hanging on and listening to me. I hope that was interesting. Um, I think we'll be hanging around for some questions at the end. Um, but yeah, thanks ever so much, and uh, hope to, hopefully speak to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dieter, do you want to join us up here for a second? So, um, yeah, some in different stuff there. A very moving video, actually. I'm a bit choked there. <laughs> um, what questions have you got for Anthony and Dieter about taking this learning outside the organization? Yeah. Um, so did everyone hear the question? Yeah. Yeah. So this is one, one system, one side, let's call it like that. <clears throat> and what is important for us is we can build up a hierarchy. That means each country has um, in the second level, we call it first level, we are located. Then in the second level, there is the countries like Austria, France, Germany, Italy, and so forth until you reach 28. And each country, in their level, they have the same rights than they would have, like it is their own system. But the problem with the own system would be then you, you lose the control as the central. It's not feasible. If every country has their own installation, sooner or later this falls apart. Um, our our partner company, Kia, I'm not sure you know that, but Yuna and Kia, they are somehow together. They tried this way. They had another vendor, they had single installations and tried to put that into a central database. And after three, four years, this was a total collapse. Mm. Because the country started to do whatever they wanted. But with the single installation in the country, the central has no control. They only made data exchange. You cannot stop them, but we can. If if it's required, we see what's going on, mm. and we can at least tell them, look, if you do this, that and that will happen. Again, we will work par as partners, but at least we are aware, and if, if it really is necessary, we can stop certain things. And on the, uh, let's put it more to the positive side, if they face problems, and now we are in the startup phase, what, what we can do occasionally, and, uh, and they appreciate is we can log in into their level, and can help sorting out issues. And that's really great for them. So what about if they want to, to, to have um, an offering specific to their country in addition to the, to the corporate offering? Yeah. Uh, that's no problem. As I just explained, their level, within their level, they have all the rights. So they can, they can create um, content internally, Within the system, there is a, a, some part is called content creator. You can create content internally, so they can do whatever they want there. We are not hindering them. They also can ask outside vendors because the system allows uh, to get standardized the score. You might know that, and some other uh, standards are available. You just can import them, or you, they even can ask a vendor to work for them within the system. So it's fully flexible.
Yeah. There, are, there are basically two ways. The more, the more simple one is, and that's why we have a tendency to use the internal tool, um, because then they just can go into that tool, open the content and re rework where they think it's necessary. If we provide external content, then of course they need to ask somebody who knows the programming or who you knows the software where it was uh, built up. And that is what, where really cost comes up. So what we, what we are planning and what we encourage uh, our partners is use the internal tool as much as you can because that's more easy for everyone. And also if that's the case, we can start sharing. So all of a sudden we find, hey, Italy has done a great job with some uh, legislation um, which is similar in our country. We just need to tweak it a little bit, <laughs> take it. Of course, we ask them, take it into the <laughs> upper level and then we can share it downwards again. Yeah. And that, that is where we will, uh, in the future, save a lot of effort and cost. Yeah, basically that's my question. Is that, uh, is that the only way you can do to share content and allow other people, you know, other stakeholders to customize it? Like, do you have to use the authoring tool of, uh, of uh, you know, that's provided with the LLS? Basically, yeah. I understand the way you do it, but... Uh, can they put content created in another way yeah. up on the system? Yeah, yeah you can. Yeah. You can. You also can use external, but then, of course, to amend the external... Yeah. yeah. But this is only if you use the external program. But again, here also, we encourage them to use the internal tool, of course. That makes more sense in sharing. But the offer that you still can use external, for example, existing content, that's also what is required to make it a success on a European level, because otherwise you cut down their freedom and the tool can be as good as it wants. If they feel like this, it's no, no good. So we, we offer the all all opportunities, let's put it like that. That's a good question then. Thank you. There's a lady over there. I'd like to ask uh, about the, uh, the vision of the uh, Marsa and what, what you want to achieve now that it will come to part. Yeah, really good question. Um, so um, I, we've recently um, started building the team. Uh, I've got my colleague Dan over here, who's uh, an e-learning developer. Um, and for me, we've started a very long journey. We've started really improving the content, improving the quality of the content, but there's so much more to do. There's a lot of content on our learning management system that is still, um, I don't want to use any swear words, but not very good. Um, so we need to rebuild all of that. Um, and then there's a lot of content that we haven't created yet. So a lot of projects that we haven't worked on. So it's um, moving the content forward, but then it's been a really um, sort of exciting, um, um, occurrence, I guess, uh, that's happened is that in my site employees, which weren't a concern to, to me in, in, initially, that wasn't part of my job remit, but in my site employees are starting to use our learning management system on a day to day basis um, to learn about in my site's products and services, and that's been so exciting because um, it's really created a buzz within the business and it's almost come sort of off the back of creating the learning management system for, uh, for customers as well. So we're really sort of trying to work on, on engaging uh, employees as well. Right. One more? Yeah. Um, I took some of the content that I kind of showed was pretty impressive in terms of the way it looks, the feel of it. Um, I suppose you're a very technical organisation, I work in retail. And I suppose um, I was quite surprised when you showed the content and the cost and said how you spent on it. I thought it was just a lot more. 
So how do you actually kind of like about developing that concept in a way that kind of hasn't yeah, I mean, we, we are at the moment doing, I'd say, 95% of our content development in-house. So we've, we've, we've recruited content developers um, and uh, we've purchased the rapid authoring tools. Um, and the guys who are, who are working on you know, developing the content are instructional designers. So, um, I mean, there are so many tools out there, where, you know, that don't require you to be, you know, an absolute expert in developing, mm. you know, there are, I mentioned a few, I think, um, Articulate Storyline is a great example. Yeah. If you're a confident designer, you can pick up a, a tool like Articulate Storyline and develop a, a piece of learning that's, that's really powerful, really engaging, without too, too much, you know, there's actually, a f I think there's a feature in it where you can import from PowerPoint. Yeah. Now, I think it's dangerous if you do that because you can end up with your... <laughs> You know, a PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation with next buttons on it, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, the concept is that you can take yeah. these tools, which are you know relatively cheap compared to what we're talking about, uh, and develop content. And it's just you're limited by your imagination, really, what you can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's also worth um, something that I had to do with no budget um, a while back when I was with Thomson Reuters. Um, create some stuff and we had no budget at all was to see if other pockets in the organization are actually doing it you'd probably be surprised that there's probably someone who's doing this for some completely different reason it may be the technical department or the marketing department or whatever um, and are using some of these much more simple tools to do it but actually they've probably paid for the license for it and you can actually start dabbling and playing with it and then building some stuff quite slowly um, and then building a power base from that so Good. Well, thank you for all. If you allow, I would have one question to him. Yeah. You do only English? Yeah, our learning management system has 26 okay. languages. Okay. So the platform itself, you can go on and you yeah. can navigate. But that's kind of irrelevant if the content isn't in a language that you understand. Yeah. yeah at the moment, everything is in English. So yeah. we've kind of, you know, we've done our done our best. That's a, that's the uh, sort of an answer to the lady who asked the question before. Mm -hmm. You know, that, it's another avenue that we can explore. But, but I think if you'd seen that, okay, I don't know if any of you were in the session um, that I was chairing before with um, uh, Brum Group and uh, EasyJet. One of the keys to success for both those journeys was how they did it stage by stage. It wasn't everything at once. Yeah. It was actually really being sure that one bit of it was established and yeah. working before they went to the next bit. And if any of you do work with global organizations, um, you do know that actually the translation one is a thorny one. Um, it can, it's very sensitive, as Dita said. If you do it badly, you get a really bad reaction to it. So actually making sure that you've got a very sound base in English first is probably one, one way of going down that road. Good. I'm going to call a halt to it, everybody. If you've got some last-minute questions for Dita or Ant, I'm sure they'd be very happy to take them just now. But I know and I'm very well aware it's the end of two, and a, two days of lots of concentration, lots of discussion, lots of thought, and that leaves one quite tired. So you're probably ready to go and have a drink outside or find your way home. Um, and it just remains to me to say these events would not be a success without you guys pitching up. Um, and I really hope that it's all been worthwhile, that you've had a good two days or one day if you've only come for the one day. And it has given you some things to think about, given you some ideas, stimulated your own learning, and hopefully we'll see you back here next year. So safe journeys home. Thank <laughs> you.